ancient Egypt, where a conspiracy might use a wax doll and magic words to kill the king. In the empire along the Nile, what seems bizarre now was the norm. Like the pharaoh's favored people. Dwarfs could dance the sacred dances of the gods. Their recreational habits. One scholar suggests that possibly a lot of people in ancient Egypt were high a lot of the time. And sex after death. In some cases, mummies have rods that are inserted into the penises to make sure that they would have erections as well. Beyond the walls of the palace, inside the royal tombs, a journey into the strangest corners of ancient Egypt. For thousands of years, the monuments of Egyptian civilization have dazzled mankind. But there is another, often unknown aspect of life along the Nile, an eerie world of magic and puzzling beliefs. To understand this ancient culture, we travel back 5,000 years and examine the strange ways that Egyptians lived and died. We begin with their creation myth, a bizarre tale of sex, incest, and violence. The Egyptians imagine that a god actually masturbated the world into existence. And out of semen came male and female gods who then reproduced through regular sexual reproduction and created a successive generation of male and female gods. In the pantheon of Egyptian deities, brother marry sister, these incestuous gods bring family feuds to violent new heights. Osiris was invited to a party by his brother Seth. And as a party favor, Seth offered a coffin. Only at an Egyptian festival would a coffin be an appropriate party favor. Driven by jealousy, Seth locks Osiris inside the coffin and throws it into the Nile. After a frantic search, Isis, Osiris's wife, finds his body. But Seth attacks again. He slices his brother into pieces and scatters body parts across the countryside. She was able to find all of the pieces except for his phallus, which had been eaten by a fish. Isis binds her husband's body together, turning Osiris into the first mummy. For thousands of years, Egyptians will imitate this story, carefully wrapping the corpses of their loved ones. Isis, however, finds another way to ensure the immortality of Osiris. By her own magical powers, she recreated a new penis and then was able to impregnate herself through her divine husband and bear his son and heir, the god Horus. Ancient Egyptians believe their magnificent civilization was formed by this mixture of incest, masturbation, and castration. It would be thousands of years before the rest of the world got a peek at how strange it could get in an Egyptian bedroom. Eighteen twenty-one, Egypt's empire is long gone. European armies occupy her land. French consul Bernardino Droviti combs through the ruins of an ancient village called Deir el Medina, looking for artifacts. Built more than 3,500 years ago, probably by Pharaoh Amenhotep III, this working-class town near the Valley of the Kings once housed the men who constructed the royal monuments. That is a very important village that we can know, we can know a lot about marriage, about love, about life of an ordinary Egyptian 
who really created the tombs. Here, Drovetti buys a huge cache of papyrus documents. He unrolls one and finds a set of shocking erotic cartoons. It has got wild scenes of men and women in most contorted positions, performing intercourse in the most bizarre ways with all sorts of uh, different accoutrements. I mean, they're, they're hilarious scenes. We're not really sure what this is about. One of the amusing things is that modern scholars have been rather trepidatious about publishing this text because it was a little too raunchy for some of them. In one scene, a woman is engaged in intercourse with a man with an enormous phallus while she has a little hand mirror and she's putting on eye makeup. Is this a satirical comment on upper-class behavior or just a private collection of pornography? Modern scholars aren't sure. But in the village of Deir el Medina, archaeologists did find evidence that sexual vitality was on the mind of the average Egyptian. The ruins of the village were littered with statues of Hathor, the goddess of love, and Bess, the male god of fertility. Bess is portrayed as a dwarf with a large phallus. Married women often tattooed images of the dwarf Bess on their thighs. Egypt was a very sensual society. The women with their beautiful gowns, and the clothing in ancient Egypt, especially for women, really enhanced the body. Oddly enough, there is no real record of the disapproval of premarital sex in ancient Egypt. Uh, we don't even have a word for virgin, which is very odd, uh, because we have so many written records. Most women married soon after puberty, at age 12 or 13, boys a few years older. Scholars believe there was no wedding. The couple simply moved in together. We have no good indication of a formal marriage ceremony. We have no good indication of the state taking any interest in marriage whatsoever. After marriage, however, the rules changed. Adultery was considered shameful. In Deir el Medina, archaeologists found legal records that suggest it was not uncommon. There's one man named Paneb, a famous workman at Deir el Medina, who was really unbelievable. He had sex with a lot of women who were married, and he even had sex with a woman and her daughter and his son had sex with the same woman's daughter. When faced with marital woes, the Egyptians invented a solution that isn't strange at all by today's standards. Divorce. What you have is actually much more like modern day United States, and that is serial monogamy. That it, it was relatively easy for either a man or a woman to divorce the spouse for cause or just because they don't like them anymore. One of the mysteries the ancient Egyptians tried to solve was how not to get pregnant. Medical documents describe several strange forms of contraception. Things like honey and a combination of dates and acacia bark. They would be substances that would be inserted into the vagina and among the least appealing are um, things like crocodile dung. Some people have suggested they were more effective at keeping men away from the woman than it was for actually contraception itself. There was also a darker, more sinister side of sexuality in ancient Egypt. One book of dream interpretations describes fantastic scenes of women having sex with a crocodile, a serpent, even a mouse. And some families felt the need to protect their loved ones against necrophilia. There is some evidence that certain bodies were not delivered to the embalmers directly after the death, but were actually kept in the house. And the assumption is because uh, the husband was afraid that the body would be violated by the embalmers. Scholars have speculated that working with the dead gave embalmers such an awful odor that not even prostitutes would sleep with them. If the behavior on the streets of Deir el-Medina seems odd to us, 
in the halls of the Pharaoh's palace, it got even more perplexing. Imitating their gods, these ancient kings sometimes entered into incestuous marriages. In order to ensure that the line was as pure as could be, they very often wound up marrying their uh, half-sisters or sisters or someone in the family. This chair belonged to Sidamon, the daughter of King Amenhotep III. In one of the more bizarre episodes of Egyptian history, she also became her father's spouse, sharing the title of great royal wife with her own mother. Wives played important roles in serving goddesses as priestesses, so it's, it's not at all clear that they were bedmates. Pharaohs maintained large harems of secondary wives and concubines, sometimes hundreds of women. This allowed them to put their own stamp on the imperial gene pool. Ramses II, for instance, fathered 55 daughters and 45 sons. This may explain why the first part of his royal title was Powerful Bull. Sex was important enough to the Egyptians that they didn't want it to be interrupted by death. They saved their strangest sexual ideas for the afterlife. Early religious texts uh, assume that a man will be able to revive fully and will be able to have sex again in the afterlife. In some cases, mummies actually have rods that are inserted into the penises to make sure that they would have erections as well. After King Tut's mummy was discovered in 1922, archaeologists examined and photographed his penis. It had been positioned as if fully erect. One expert commented that the king had been flattered by the embalmer's work. However, when researchers x-rayed the mummy in 1968, the organ appeared to be missing. It was feared that a member of the expedition had stolen it. The speculation ended in 2005, when Dr. Zahi Hawass conducted a CT scan. Tut's penis was right where it should have been, and not on some antiquarian's bookshelf. Dark forces in the service of love. Strange ingredients, a scarab beetle, milk of a black cow, apple seeds, nail clippings, and a pot of human urine. These substances came from the toolkit of a highly skilled magician. Egyptians believed potions like this, combined with spells and incantations, connected them to the mystical power of the universe. They uh, were very interested in controlling their own environment, as we are. But they couldn't control it through scientific ways. They wound up controlling it through magical ways. A papyrus from the second or third century tells of these magical ways, of a sorcerer who used these substances in hopes of making a woman fall in love with him. The notion of magic is fundamental to the Egyptian understanding of their gods and the universe. If you can make use of this force, which underlies the universe, then you too can make use of words or images and have a practical effect. With the scarab in his hand, the magician recites a long spell, thus dispatching it on his mission of love. He then drowns the beetle in the vial of cow's milk. Half the bug is cooked with the nail clippings, apple seeds, and urine. This mixture is poured into a jug of wine with more incantations. All that's left is to somehow convince the object of his desire to drink the concoction. We don't know whether the potion worked, but we do know that sorcery was normal in ancient Egypt. Priest magicians had no divine calling. It was a hereditary post. And a part-time one, priests served for about three months of the year. During that time, they adhered to strict rules of ritual purity. They abstained from sex and meat. 
To get himself in the mood for spell casting, a conjurer might chew the flowers of a blue lotus, a plant known for its psychedelic effects. There was a desire to transport yourself and experience dreams. And this was part of the way of divination, the way of figuring out what would happen or what should happen. People relied on the magician's skill to protect them from spirits of the dead who had not been properly mummified. Egyptians feared such ghosts stalked the world, spreading evil. There were magical ivory knives designed to draw a protective circle around the bed to protect you in the evening. And these have figures of protective gods brandishing knives to ward off demonic forces that might attempt to cross that line. A conjurer could also create a magical text like this one. Written more than 2,700 years ago, it was probably commissioned by the father of a young child. It is a decree promulgated by a temple which says that I, God so-and-so, will protect you, your name written here, from a wide variety of diseases, illnesses, nightmares that would be a problem for you for the duration of your life. For Egyptians, the world of magic and the spirits of their ancestors were familiar territory. There was actually very little real separation between the land of the living and the dead. You could communicate through letters to the dead. It was one of the most effective ways. This simple clay pot covered with hieroglyphs is one of the strangest examples of a letter to the dead. This long letter written by a man to his deceased father asks for help against sickness on behalf of himself and his wife, and in addition that his dead father ensure that he and his sister both have healthy children born to them. Egyptians used wax effigies to create even more powerful magic and curse their enemies. The practice is directly comparable to what Hollywood considers the voodoo doll, but which has a much longer history in Egypt, where you actually have figures that are pierced, buried upside down, trampled, and boiled. Exotic rituals weren't always necessary to summon magical forces. Sometimes all it took was a single word. Since Heka, the god of magic, was also the god of images, the pictures that made up Egyptian hieroglyphs were one of the most potent forms of magic. The signs themselves had the magical ability to come to life. It was often important, the Egyptians thought, to actually disable potentially dangerous hieroglyphs from attacking the dead man. For instance, to neutralize the power of the symbol for snake, a scribe would draw daggers through its body. Some believe the power of Egyptian magic could reach around the globe and across centuries. Archaeologist Harold Carter discovered the tomb of King Tutankhamun only after years of searching. When he opened the crypt, Carter was dazzled by the glint of gold, magnificent headpieces, ceremonial knives, and jewelry filled the crypt. This exquisite miniature sarcophagus, he learned, once held Tut's liver. It also contained something much stranger violent curses. Hieroglyphs inscribed in the gold lining threaten a painful death for anyone who disturbs Tut's remains. Some believe these curses actually worked. Lord Carnarvon, who financed the Tut expedition, died of a mysterious infection only a year after the discovery. At the moment of his death, Cairo was darkened by a massive power failure. More than 2,000 miles away in London, Carnarvon's dog began to howl. Newspaper reports of the time detail the deaths of more than 20 other men who had entered the tomb. It created in the mind of the newspaper reporters the curse of the pharaohs and all these things that captured the hearts of the people. Experts attribute the deaths to something much less strange. They say Carnarvon died from an infected mosquito bite, and others may have been affected by bacteria 
or poisonous gases in Tut's ancient crypt. Yet many still believe Tut's curse is proof of Egyptian magic's strange power. Egypt, 15th century BC. Pharaoh Hatshepsut, a self-proclaimed king, was lord of the Nile. Hatshepsut was a popular leader, masterful politician, and skilled diplomat, whose bearded image appeared on statues and tomb paintings. The strange thing was, this king of the Nile was a woman. Hatshepsut was the daughter of one pharaoh and the wife of another, her own brother. When her brother died, Hatshepsut's nephew ascended the throne. She became his regent, in charge of making important decisions. She evidently got tired of being just the regent and declared herself king. She had herself represented as a king with a beard and wearing the, the male kilt usually rather than the, the woman's dress. Only a few women ruled Egypt. The last was Cleopatra in the first century AD. For the men who ruled, the palace was a place where their every whim and strange desire was satisfied. You're filled with beautiful women who are part of the harem, probably, or let's say, women who are part of the pharaoh's entertainment. While the common folk ate mostly bread and beer, the royals feasted on beef, waterfowl, pork and fish, all washed down with flagons of sweet wine. One thing you'd never see on the pharaoh's table was the oxyrhynchus fish. Egyptians believe this denizen of the Nile had eaten the penis of the god Osiris after his evil brother Seth tossed it into the river. If the food that did appear on the king's table wasn't strange, the waiter might be. Trained baboons sometimes served the royals. Egyptians considered them sacred and kept them as pets. They also put the simians to work as fruit pickers and even bathroom attendants. An equally odd Egyptian belief was that dwarves were close to the gods. Dwarves were often brought in to entertain the pharaoh. Dwarfs were considered by the ancient Egyptians to be special players in Egyptian religious roles. They could dance the sacred dances of the gods. They amused the gods. Egyptians treated dwarves with reverence and respect. They were not only entertainers, but held important positions. This statue from the 23rd or 24th century BC shows the dwarf Seneb, a royal attendant and priest, with his family. Because of their stature, they were considered to be eternally youthful. And in ancient Egypt, this idea of youthfulness, in other words, rebirth, not dying, was a very important symbol to them. Celebrations were not just for the Egyptian pharaohs. In a worker's town like Deir el Medina, the people who built the royal tombs took time off to celebrate important feast days and to let off some steam in their own way. Religious festivals were really raucous. They were like Mardi Gras, a little bit more free sexuality than you normally get up to, under the cover of the erotic influence of the goddess Hathor, the goddess of revelry and love and sexuality. The party atmosphere was enhanced with generous quantities of beer, sipped through straws. Even children drank it. Ancient Egyptians loved their beer. By the time we reached the historical era, beer brewing and bread production was already commonplace. Egyptians made bread and beer from the same crop, barley. To brew beer, they first soaked the grain so it would sprout, a process known as malting. Malting produces enzymes that will help turn the starch into sugar when the grain is boiled. This step, called mashing, also sterilized the brew. Pure water was a rare commodity in ancient Egypt. The Nile water was already polluted. It had devastating organisms in it, and beer was a safe beverage to drink. The Egyptians didn't just drink beer for their health. The next step, their fermentation, turns the sugar into alcohol. 
Straws could be used to penetrate the upper layer of floating debris. Ancient beer was uh, somewhat sweet, which have been characterized as tasting something like Chardonnay. Alcohol was probably not the only intoxicant used in the village of Deir el Medina. There, archaeologists found hundreds of small clay vessels that once held opium. The drug was also used as a teething remedy for infants. One scholar suggests that possibly a lot of people in ancient Egypt were high a lot of the time. Decades of research amid the ruins of Deir el Medina gave archaeologists a unique look at the details of daily life in Egypt. They found remnants of the mud brick houses that most Egyptians lived in. They were surprised when they uncovered toilets. Poorest people in villages would do probably what the poorest people do today, which is go outside the house in the desert. But the wealthy had toilets. They had both wooden toilet seats and there were stone carved toilet seats for the very wealthy. So someone like a general or a major city administrator would have his throne, uh, if you can consider it that. Millennia before the invention of toilet paper and modern notions of sanitation, men and women, rich and poor, simply used their fingers to wipe themselves. The Egyptians invented the idea of the bathroom. It was a place for both men and women to fuss over their appearance in private. Egyptian men wore elaborate wigs made out of human hair. Nevertheless, they worried about going bald. They rubbed the milky juice of lettuce leaves on their head in hopes of sprouting hair and attracting women. Lettuce was the favorite food of the male fertility god, Min. The god Min is frequently shown with uh, lettuces behind him. The oil from the lettuce leaves is seen as being the equivalent of semen. Living in the desert, the people of Deir el Medina were plagued by lice. Egyptians kept their hair short and shaved their body hair. The Egyptians took regular baths, scandalized the Greeks who thought they bathed far too much. The Egyptians were the first ones to actually create a form of soap using natron, a naturally occurring bicarbonate of soda. And they used this to clean their mouth, to clean their body, so that when they went into special sacred spaces, they would be ritually pure. Egyptian medicine was equally strange. For cataracts, the doctor would likely prescribe mashed brain of tortoise. For a burning rectum, try a compress made from onion meal, honey, water, and the tail of a dead mouse. Concern for cleanliness led the Egyptians to become one of the first cultures to practice circumcision for men. Starting more than 4,000 years ago, priests performed circumcisions with crude flint knives. They did it as a rite of passage into adulthood. By today's standards, it seems a little um, gruesome that young men were circumcised when they were in their early teens rather than as infants. In the 23rd century BC, a man named Uha commissioned this stone tablet as a monument to the greatest moment in his life, his circumcision. He says, after the usual platitudes of Egyptian thought, I gave bread to the hungry, was helpful to the widow and the orphan, I gave a boat to the person who had none, that I was circumcised together with 120 men, and not one of us cried out, not one of us scratched. Archaeologists have found many strange memorials in Egypt, but this one may be the strangest. The ancient city of Abydos is the site of many of the oldest ruins in Egypt. The temple to Osiris dates from the 32nd century BC. On its walls are perhaps the strangest hieroglyphs in all of Egypt. Some believe they are evidence that the ancient Egyptians possessed 20th century technology more than 5,000 years ago. In that temple, you actually have carvings of helicopters planes, a spaceship, and possibly a submarine, all carved into the stone. 
These symbols led author John Van Auken to a controversial theory. He believes Egypt's great civilization was founded by an older but much more advanced society, one that actually built monuments like the Great Pyramid at Giza. The Great Pyramid of Giza is a real piece of physical evidence that something very sophisticated was there and achieved this accomplishment, which we haven't been able to replicate. It is hard to understand how a society that lacked even wheeled carts moved the two and a half million stone blocks that make up the pyramid. Some weigh as much as 70 tons. Who could accomplish such a monumental task? Van Auken believes people from the legendary lost continent of Atlantis migrated to Egypt after a massive flood destroyed their homeland. These survivors, he claims, brought with them mystical powers. They became the ancestors of Egypt's pharaohs and high priests. The Atlanteans used metaphysical and physical properties of the electromagnetic energy and radiation in building the pyramid, to carve them perfectly, to move them and put them in position perfectly. Modern scholars are confident that the Egyptians used their skill and social organization to build the monuments, not otherworldly powers. This is selling the Egyptians short. If you look at the interior blocks of the Great Pyramid, you find that there are quarry marks by the Egyptians themselves. So if you had space aliens who built it, they had to be space aliens who could read and write Egyptian. Experts believe that the odd symbols at Abydos were actually created by stone carvers correcting earlier mistakes. You know, I have been working at Giza for the last 25 years, excavating, revealing secrets from the sand. We never discovered one single evidence to tell us anything about lost civilization at Egyptians didn't just construct stone monuments. They also built a sophisticated social structure with their own ideas about justice. Madinat Habu, Egypt, 12th century BC. A group of royal wives, generals, harem officials, and priests meet secretly in the pharaoh's palace. They're planning a murder. In the ancient world, some killed with knives, some with poison. These villains are using the strangest weapon of all, magic. They made wax dolls, which they manipulated in the same way as modern voodoo dolls. But what is clear is that magic was completely legal because the texts were taken from the royal library. What was illegal was the name of who is going to be attacked. That name was Ramses III. He eventually uncovered what court records call the harem conspiracy. One of his own wives had hatched the plot. She hoped to kill the pharaoh and put her son on the throne. That's something we would have no idea about if there hadn't been discovered a text that describes legal proceedings against a series of men who were in cahoots with the queen. We have the punishments that were meted out to them, which were invariably death. Members of the royal family who participated were allowed to commit suicide. Dozens of others were executed. Although the text doesn't specify how, it is certain that the pharaoh's vengeance was slow and painful. Typical Egyptian execution methods included burning alive and excruciating death by impalement. What we see from the hieroglyphs must have involved a large pole erected in the sand, sharpened, and the human being still alive being forcibly brought down on that pole until they died. The harem conspiracy demonstrates one aspect of Egyptian justice. The pharaoh was the law. 
The Egyptian judicial system was kind of odd because we have almost no, no law codes, almost no written law codes. Law came from Pharaoh himself. The principle of justice was represented by Maat, a goddess with a tall ostrich feather in her headdress. It was called the Feather of Truth. Ma'at is an extremely important goddess because it represents a concept of decorum. It also represents divine order. Egyptians believe that if Ma'at ceased to exist, the world would degenerate into chaos. In a town like Deir el Medina, village elders would use the concept of Ma'at to settle disputes. The Egyptians were incredibly litigious. They were constantly suing each other. We even have examples of people who are alive suing people who are dead. We have examples of people who go to a court and they call upon the person who's dead to give witness against this person who's living. If they were unhappy with the verdict, Egyptians would appeal to the gods directly. In the temple, they would stand before an oracle statue like this falcon. People would ask questions as simple as, uh, who stole my chisel? And questions as important as, will I get the job that I want, to the god. This statue had a hole attached to a speaking tube. A priest, perhaps in a trance-like state, would deliver the answer from a hidden room. A little bit sort of like the Wizard of Oz, you know, where there's the man behind the curtain. For Egyptians, Final justice was rendered after death by a strange, divine court. If you had committed sin, then your heart would be eaten by a horrible monster who's called the Devourer. Perhaps the most bizarre thing of all about the ancient Egyptians is that they believed their strange habits would continue forever, even after death. Immortality was at the heart of Egyptian civilization. Over thousands of years, they developed elaborate rituals to prepare bodies. This way, the dead were ready for the perilous journey to the next world and judgment by the gods. The journey to the afterlife really was seen as a physical journey in ancient Egypt. And what was really important was that the body be made whole and that the soul, in its various forms, could return to the body eternally. Mummification, the most famous of Egypt's strange practices, was an elaborate process. First, attendants carefully washed the corpse. Using an iron hook, they crushed the brain, pulled the pieces through the nasal passage, and discarded them. Then the embalmers removed the internal organs and preserved them in ceremonial jars, except for the heart, which stayed in the body. For the ancient Egyptians, like medieval Europeans, the heart was the center of the emotions, which is why we send hearts at Valentine's Day and not brains. Sometimes Egypt's burial practices took a toll on the living. Early in its history, the pharaoh's servants and even high officials were ritually killed, perhaps with poison, and placed in the royal tomb. This was to ensure the king would be cared for in the afterlife. As Egyptian civilization advanced, this grisly ritual was abandoned. Substituting for the dead retainers were stone figures which imitated all the various actions you needed your assistants to perform for you. To keep the deceased company in the afterlife, tombs were filled with a menagerie of mummified animals. Baboons, cats, dogs, alligators, and birds like this one. Even in ancient times, this strange practice attracted attention. Greek travelers reported that Egyptians worshipped cats and would shave off their eyebrows when the family pet died. Selling feline mummies as tourist souvenirs became a common and lucrative sideline for some temple employees. Although they revered cats just like so many other animals as sort of avatars or manifestations of gods, they killed hundreds and thousands of cats because they would raise cats in temples 
kill them, mummify them, and sell them to pilgrims. This was big business in ancient Egypt. Archaeologists found even stranger things inside crypts, including a working toilet. Before the crypt was closed, priests equipped the mummy with amulets, magic jewelry, and books of spells. Preparation for the strange and perilous journey to the land of the dead. His spirit must then travel through the underworld, uh, avoiding a series of dangers and pitfalls designed by demons and otherworldly creatures to prevent him from reaching the god Osiris. First, the spirit traveled to the Hall of Two Truths, where a panel of 42 gods with names like Strider, Eater of Shadows, and Breaker of Bones challenged his virtue. The deceased must proclaim the sins he didn't commit. Some were quite bizarre. I didn't eat excrement. I didn't drink urine. I didn't fornicate with anyone other than my wife. I didn't have sex with a man. I didn't have sex with an animal. They also include every single sexual activity you might think of. And if this were true and you never could do any of these things, there would have been no Egyptians left to utter these spells. But what if you had committed one of these transgressions? Or just forgotten the right answer? The Egyptians were ready for that. The correct responses were packed with the mummy in a book that was perhaps the strangest thing ever written in the Egyptian language. The book of the dead. They were written down in papyrus, and these were mass produced. They were actually left with blanks for your name. You know, fill in name of dead person here. So you were uh, kind of like absolved of all sins through the purchase of this very special document. If the Book of the Dead performed as promised, and the 42 assessor gods were satisfied, the spirit was ready for the final ritual. He presented himself to Osiris, the god of the dead. Osiris placed his heart on a scale. On one side was the heart, and on the other side was the feather, which uh, represented the goddess Ma'at. So everything had to balance. If your heart was heavy and you had committed sin, then the pan would hit the floor and clatter. And with that, your heart would be eaten by a horrible monster who's called the devourer. If it was as light as the feather and you had lived a good life, you would be pronounced to be true of voice or justified, which meant that your life had been worthwhile. Finally, the spirit entered the next world, known as the Field of Reeds. Attendants unwrapped the mummy and prepared the person for the wonders of eternity. They open his mouth, then he can eat in the afterlife. They open his nose, then he can smell. And they open his eyes, then he can see. In the field of reeds, the field of paradise, grain grows to colossal heights. Food is abundant. It was never anything but a sunny, beautiful day where you had all the abundance, the coolness of the breezes of the north, and where you live for eternity in happiness with your wife and family. With these death rituals, the ancient Egyptians hoped to recreate their strange earthly civilization here, in the field of reeds. In essence, your tomb is the temple for you as a deified spirit, and your mummy is the cult image of you. That's why it has to be protected. That's why it has to be fed. That's why it's essentially treated just like a god. After the funeral, it is a god. Incestuous kings, magic spells, letters to the dead. Ancient Egypt's way of life and death seem strange and distant. Yet even with their fascination with baboons, dwarves, and mummies, Egyptians created a culture whose soaring monuments are still with us today. Almost 2,000 years after the last pharaoh, 
the magnificence of Egyptian civilization and the strangeness still dazzle us.